What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Welcome to Saturday. Hopefully you're hearing me okay. Are you on AT&T? Do you copy? Are you copying me now? Can you hear me? Uh, enjoy the memes, and I'll wait for your five nines in, five nines in the chat, because we got a fun interview about teaching people about amateur radio and fun novel ways to do that. we got our friend Good Game is in the house, K5ATA. What's up, Steve? Good to see you. And uh, see a lot of other folks, our friends on the YouTube. So we're going to get started real soon. Thank you for the five nines, everybody. Enjoy the memes. What's up, everybody? What just happened? You gotta love, uh... <laughs> you gotta love... <laughs> Did I just love... <laughs> Stop! Alright, well, we're gonna just end that. I, I'm telling you, I am plagued with problems. <laughs> Non-stop problems. It killed it again. My Steam Deck just died. That's weird. Ah, there we go. We got it. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Thanks for hanging out, or thanks for joining me here on a Saturday. Uh, I was talking with Drew. Drew is our, our, our guest today. Man, we were talking about video games, and we we're talking about Pinewood Derby. I just had uh, my kids' Pinewood Derby competition today for their scout troop. We did okay, but uh, next year I'm, I'm going whole hog. We'll talk about that probably in the after chat. By the way, if you're watching us here on YouTube, this is about an hour-long stream. We've got a, a topic we're going to hit. We're going to stay focused on that. So if, you, if you're typing your questions, make sure you do questions or at Ham Radio Crash Course uh, and try to keep it about, you know, educating the, the hams of the future, the people that don't know their hams yet. And Drew's going to talk to us uh, about that and his experiences with the Teaching Institute from the ARRL. But after that, we do a really long live stream we call Hams Helping Hams, where we answer your questions. We're going to talk about the AT&T thing. We're going to talk about all that other stuff. So link is in the description to the Discord to get joining us over there so you'll be able to join in on all the fun. So real fast before we welcome Drew onto the, onto the show... Go check out hamtactical.com. It is the merch store for the Ham Radio Crash Course and the Ham Radio Crash Course podcast, and it's ran by my wonderful wife, Leah. Hey, James Hannibal, thank you for the the support. Appreciate it. I was born with a ham radio in my hand. Well, then you're a lucky one, and I feel bad for your mother. Hey, guys, we've got a camp out coming up in April. Last weekend in April, we're going to be going to Silverwood Lake. It is a ham radio focused camp out, but there will be fishing and boating and the great outdoors. So if you're curious, there's a link in the description to RSVP for that if you will be in the Hesperia area. So if you remember, we did a a telethon <laughs> a charity event with Mike K and MRD. And that's where I got to meet Drew. Steve K5ATA was on to talk about the Teachers Institute. And uh, it was a blast. I, I, I loved his energy. I, I loved his passion for the hobby and, and all he's everything he's doing with uh, educating the youth. Right. And so I was like, oh, we got to have Drew on. And finally, we got it worked out. Largely, it was it was my fault. But he's uh, very gracious and is, is joining us tonight. But big shout out to the ARRL Teachers Institute. Uh, it is through a lot of what they do that kind of helped facilitate a pretty major thing that we were able to pull off that Drew's going to talk about. Drew is also on YouTube, so go check him out. He's got some ham radio videos there, and the link is in the description as well. But uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and bring Drew on. How are you doing, man? Good to hear from you. Doing great. How are you, Josh? I'm I'm doing well. Uh, so how, how's how's your weekend been, or how's your week been so far? Um, well, it's actually been a lot of fun. Uh, so I, I will get into all sorts of stuff, but mm. we got a, we got a, we got our first HF Yagi up on the roof of the school this week. And so that, of that alone makes it a great week. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Nothing better than a new antenna week. So if, I mean, if you right. have, you, you haven't had it up for very long, but if you had any impressive contacts or anything you want to mention? 
No, so so the kids uh, the kids build it. One of our well, two of our local hams uh, donated the aluminum uh, and then helped us uh, to figure out you know how to do it. And so the kids did it. The kids worked with uh, two of our Elmers to kind of you know figure it all out. Uh, and they built it, they put it together and then they got it up onto the roof. It's, uh, you know, you know, they, they, they did it all right. Like they, that's impressive, which, which was a blast. And so I'll share a picture of that later on, but yeah, I mean, again, anytime that you have a week where you get a, uh, an antenna in the air is a good week. So, yeah, absolutely. So we met at the, this charity event with Mike Kate of RD, and you were talking about your experience with the Teachers Union and our Teachers Institute. And I don't know if you had done the Eris contact by then, or you were still planning it. Do you remember what 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 about time frame that was? Yeah. So uh, the the telethon was in January, mid January, I think, yes. uh, yeah. or early January, uh, and then we had the contact in the beginning of December, around December eleventh. Yeah, so give us a little bit of background on that. You uh, are an assistant principal at. You, you don't have to mention the school or anything if you don't sure. want to. You don't have to give any background, and you don't have to give up the personal details. <laughs> uh, but tell us, tell us about that. So you 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 decided to reach out to Eris, or how how did that all go? Sure. Uh, all right. So. It started probably back about 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, had a bunch of students that were doing a lot of technology-related things after school. Uh, it was kind of our own little, uh, you know, nerd unit that was going on there. We uh, used to uh, squirrel ourselves away uh, in a room that we, uh, you know, eventually dubbed Area 51 because it had all of this like high-tech stuff going on in there, uh, and that's where we would just disappear for hours and hours. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, in that area, it was kind of, uh, the, the brainchild was formed to, to do amateur radio and to do, uh, weather balloons and high altitude balloons and to eventually hopefully do an heiress contact. Once the, uh, once the students understood a little bit about amateur radio, they were like, yeah, we really want to do this. We want to work towards this, yeah. except at that point, like none of us knew enough about anything to be able to do it. So we just kind of started to set the wheels in motion, uh, but it wasn't until 2022 that I attended the Teachers Institute with the ARRL, uh, and that's where they really, you know, they did an, a fantastic job uh, equipping us and giving us the, you know, understanding to be able to make that contact a reality. Um, so it took a whole bunch of years to get there, but we knew of that we were we knew we were getting there all along. And so we had started to buy some of the equipment, but not knowing how to use it or what to do with it. Um, that sounds like a very ham thing you did there. That is a, <laughs> that is a, I know I want this real bad and I, I don't know a hundred percent how to use it yet, but gosh, darn it. We're just going to buy it. <laughs> That, that's exactly it. Uh, right. You know, there was a, there was a grant um, that we were able to get in 2020, I think it was right before COVID. And uh, you know, we, we just put in for it on a whim and we basically just said, we're going to do aerospace type related projects with radio. And they were like, sure, here, here's some money. And oh, I gotta love that. And so it was super like, like it was like two sentences long for the grant application. And they gave us the money to be able to, to, to get a radio, to get a, an ICOM 9700 and to be able to get some of the stuff uh, for the, like a full antenna as L, you know, system. Oh yeah. Um, oh so like, yeah. So you're all set up. Oh, I love right, it for right, kids. That's perfect. Yeah. That, that uh, younger people love these satellite type contacts. That's right. amazing. But um, no idea how to use it. Yeah. Well, well, you'll get to you're getting right. to that point, right? right. So, big yeah. shout out to Arthur. Thank you for 21 months of YouTube membership. Really appreciate that. So, for those watching, it sounds like looking at the chat, there's a number of new people in the house. So, ARIS, we're using an acronym. We're kind of throwing this back and forth. ARIS stands for Amateur Radio International Space Station. So, it's a program. A group of folks. Uh, I think it's a it's a nonprofit. I'm I'm not sure exactly. Don't don't quote me on that. But uh, they go to schools and they set up a contact with the International Space Station, and the facilitation of that communication is amateur radio. So you're building a station at the school. You're getting that Azel rotor that can turn and lift and all that stuff to be able to eventually make these errors contacts. Right. So. Yep. Keep going. You go to the Teachers Institute and what starts happening there? So, yeah, so we go to the Teachers Institute uh, and really big shout outs to the two teachers that were there, Tommy Gober and Wayne Green, um, who were just fantastic at training all of the teachers that were there, helping us to get our start, uh, get our feet wet with all of it. 
Um, you know, a bunch of teachers didn't have their licenses, got their licenses while they were there, That's cool. um, you know, but really just trying to help us to understand how these things actually work. So there was like fundamental physics side of it. Then there was also just, uh, you know, the, the rules, regulations and the how to nuts and bolts of it. Um, you know, which was fantastic because as we had some of the equipment knowing that we wanted to do that, but without the understanding of it, um, you know, it was, it was clutch to be able to have some people there to be able to say, look, this is how you do this thing. Oh, it's, um, it's an incredible resource for that. Right. So you're basically just like, this is where we want to be. How do we get there? Like what's right. the steps, right? Cause they've got yep. Eris contacts or they know folks that can at least like help you fill out the application. Cause it's an application process, right? Correct. Yes. Um, and so, you know, we, we applied for it in December, J November, December of 2022. Um, and then it was, a pr we had to go through a few different revisions of it. So like we submitted it, they kicked it back to us. They said, ah, you know, you got to tweak some things here or there. Cause again, like we didn't know really what sure. to expect from yeah. it. And then, uh, eventually, you know, that it got approved. Um, it, but the whole process was over a year long from the yeah. time that we applied to the time of the contact. It was more than one year in length, but we needed that whole year, like truly. Uh, yeah. Right. We, we needed that time. So I, it sounds like it's also probably that's a good project length for kids in school, because, you know, ideally you're going to have them for a couple of years and you're building up a, a ham club or whatever. And so you start, you, we're going to do this all together. We're going to write this thing out. We're going to go through the process the revisions, all that stuff, building right. up to this crescendo of this actual 10 minute long ISS pass where you get to talk to the astronauts. And so I guess you've got the station together, you got the education and kind of fast forward as to as you're getting close to the event, what was that kind of like? Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was pretty, in, it was pretty nuts. Uh, and the main reason why is because like you can test all you want but NASA and Eris don't give you the frequencies and there is no way to test until like ah. a couple, there's like no way to test it period. But then they don't give you the frequencies until it's like two days before the event. And so, you know, you're, you're bouncing a signal off of the ISS repeater to get your practice in, but like, you're always kind of sitting there wondering like, are the regular are these frequencies that I I now will have to program in a couple days before? Are they going to work the same way? Is everything going to work exactly the way it you know like the analog of it is on the ISS repeater? Like, is this all going to work correctly the same way? And you just don't know until you actually are there at game time. Like, there's no way of testing it ahead of time. So, so that's fascinating. So you you got everything set up. You got the kind of you got it all put together. Antenna talking to the ninety seven hundred. You got some rotor control, so you know, blah blah blah. Um, mm -hmm. So the the ISS for those that are watching has a uh, cross band repeater, right? So you're you're transmitting up, it's coming back down. So you're using that as like your proof of concept, right? If exactly. You will. So did you make some? Did the kids make some satellite contacts with the ISS before you actually got to the point of the Eris contact? Yep. So they started making contacts about six months ahead of time and they six started months. Working. That's fantastic. Okay, yep. cool. Yep. So, so they were consistently hitting uh, different satellites for about six months prior to the air uh, to the Ares contact. So this is and before so, uh, not even ISS. You're doing FM birds. You're doing the whole nine yards. Yes, we're doing FM. We're doing the linears, um, you know, and so the. Oh, the, the learning curve was really, really steep at the beginning, yeah. of it, right? And so for them to, you know, like they're getting out of classes and they're specifically going to try and hit these uh, these satellites as they're making passes. So we've got this, you know, massive spreadsheet going every single week because you can only project out, you know, right. like seven days or whatever yes. for each of the satellites. So so we've got the spreadsheet and we're like, all right, well, these kids are going to be out for, you know, this period and this period and this period. Oh, you pulled them out of class to do oh, this? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're. Uh, uh. So yeah. Because the satellites don't wait for anybody. They're on their yeah. orbit, right? And so right. you worked the FM sats and the linears. Did the kids have like a certain preference at some point as they started like getting more experience under their belt? So like SO fifty and like FO twenty nine and uh, you know there's a bunch of them, but like the 
there were ones that we could consistently get every single time. Mm -hmm. And then there were others where it was completely hit or miss. And we always kept thinking like, Oh, we've got the Doppler corrected properly. Or, you know, they're like, they're like, yeah, we set it, you know, as you know, one kilohertz off like that. It was positive 100 kilohertz this time. We think we've got it right now. And nope. Like next time it comes along and completely wrong, couldn't get into it at all. And so, you know, it was, it was months of just them. Oh, I love it troubleshooting and trying yeah. to figure it out and like th- looking at the, the sheets of paper where they've got all of their notes written down of like what happened and why did this go wrong and you this know is fantastic i mean you're literally making young engineers because these are all engineering problems right is you, you've got all the material you know it should work and you're like right. or just I'm, I'm i'm off just by that much shout out to corpse a lot my friend my buddy corpse a lot thank you for the super chat man i appreciate it so you, you get you know, you you start laying the groundwork, right? They're they're experienced now, six months out from the the planned contact. So you start getting like that month out. What's what's that like as you start getting closer to the air's contact? Um, you know, it started to get a lot more nerve wracking, honestly. Um, so there was a lot of things that were going on at that time. But one of the biggest was that, uh, you know we we weren't entirely sure where we were going to host the contact from because we have our own setup like we have our own radio room, right you have right? a radio Everything room is... that can't have an audience right. in it right yeah 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 right exactly it's dedicated space right but we can't have an audience and you know eris was like hey we'd really like for this to you know they really want it to be a bigger thing involve of the course. whole school and involve yeah. the community yeah. and we were like well, we really want to do that too but how do you move the entire, you know, physical thing, the installed thing? We've got all of the cables, LMR 600 cables that are all run down into our radio room. Yep. And so like, we've got to do, we've got to make, we've got to make all new LMR 600 cable runs in order to get it into the gymnasium. And you and start so losing, like, okay. you start getting losses as you're going up in frequency and distance of coax, all that becomes, well, is it going to work as right. well? Yeah. All those considerations. Yeah. Well, and then, and then the cost, right? Like LMR 600 is not cheap. No. And so, you know, it's like, oh, well, we got to, we've got to get 200 foot LMR 600 runs and we've got to have it for the primary and the backup. And then we've got to have it for the the 70 centimeter because we've got to be able to test on the linear sats just to make sure everything is working correctly. And then we need new rotator, uh, uh, control cables that are 200 feet long because uh, that's not what we have going right now. So every, yep. we had to buy a whole other set of everything uh, to get it shifted down. So it was just like, there was a lot of that, you know, setup prep stress yeah. in, you know, getting ready for all of it. So the absolute it, chaos was, it was really it. exciting though. So you, yes, that, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, that, this is the, you know, the reality of this kind of stuff is it's, it's real logistics to be able to, to make it happen, uh, particularly if you're going to have an audience, because how normally it's a ham shack, a bunch of kids come in it, you have 10 people in there at most, and that's it. But now you're like, oh, we're going to talk to the astronauts. Oh, the local news is coming out. You know, the mayor's mm-hmm. coming out. He wants to be there. You know, it's the whole, it's the whole thing. So you get to the day of the event. What, what's that like? So it was actually about a week before the event okay. and we got a phone call from, um, from Eris and they were like, Hey, we got a phone call from the NBC today show. And they yeah. were wondering if they could come out and, you know, and, and take a look at what you guys are doing and maybe do a segment about, you know, all of the things that Eris does. Mm-hmm. And we're like, sure, of course, you know, of course, why would we not invite the national news to yeah. come in and, you know, do a segment on this? So, of course, that elevates everything, right? Like all of the, you know, expectations, all of the stress, like everything, you know, just goes through the roof, which all the excitement does as well, because, yep. you know, it's great for the kids that they're going to get that kind of exposure too. you start getting all the uh, help from people who you haven't heard from before. And then all of a sudden they want to be involved in the whole planning and situation all that well you know again like it was one of those things where it was like there was no way that we could pull this off ourselves right okay no way so you all. did get so, good help you got good help oh my people. goodness it was uh, fantastic like we had so much support from our school and from the school community uh and from the local club i mean it was it was truly a, a gigantic team effort um to make it you know to, to pull it off in, in a spectacular fashion that's um, that's so, awesome so yeah. a couple of quick uh, shout outs. KM Kev, thanks for the super chat. Oh, he got his technician. Uh, thanks to some of my videos. Well, congratulations. I appreciate you joining us. 
And uh, let me hit that one from Bill. Josh, thanks for making a session about education. It's great to see. Well, we've got some questions on that as well. So day of, you know, you're able to, how many kids did you get through to ask questions over that about 10 minute pass-ish time you had? I think we got through 14 students. Right. So somewhere right around there. Explain that a little bit for people. Again, we've got some new people who are in the house tonight. What does that look like? Because you're, yeah. I, 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 the link is in the description, by the way, guys. You can watch a lot of the video actually kind of showing this. Uh, but in your words, kind of what, what happened? Sure. So we have about 30 students in the group. Uh, so it's an after school club, right? And we've got about 30. Of that 30, uh, about uh, 20 or so had said that they would like to ask questions. Of the 20, about 17 had their licenses. Um, oh, and so you got 17 kids licensed? Right. Currently, we have 17 that are licensed uh, over the past two years, ones that have graduated and moved on uh, about 30 or so in the past couple of years. Um, That's great. And, yeah. And so job. so like the the ones that had their license, they were, you know, in the front of the line. Right. And, you know, and we we shifted it from, you know, like extras uh, to generals to techs. And, uh, you know, they just they had they had their questions prepped. The questions have to be approved by NASA. Um, and so they had, you know, they knew what they were going to be asking. And so they all line up, right. And they're, they're all excited. They're jazzed up. They're ready to go. They're all lined up to be able to ask their questions. And then the, the student that's, uh, uh the president of our club, he starts calling out, right. Like yep. his, you know, our school call sign. And then he's calling out, uh, you know, uh, the, for the, for, for NASA, for the ISS and, and he's just waiting, right. Like he's just repeating this over and over and over again, that, that tense moment, that, that wait. Meeting, yeah for them to yeah. come back and, and we we prepped the crowd out we're like look we're gonna start this really early so that way we can get it for, at the exact moment that the iss crosses the threshold and we're going to you know so like there's going to be a long time between but you know when you could you could say that all you want but when you're waiting five oh, minutes 500 or 700 people in front of you and the news and you know it, yes, absolutely. Um, but he did it. And then sure enough, you know, the, you know, uh, commander Mogison, uh, responded to him and the, the, the relief, the jubilation, the crowd goes wild. There's right? cheering. Like, yeah. 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 I, I saw, a, it was a, I watched the video. I watched the Today Show part of it. And uh, is it Al Roker? Al Roker is a ham, mm -hmm. I, I learned from, yep. from that little clip, which is pretty cool. And he yeah. did the exact thing. He's like, well, you know, when, when AT&T goes down, uh, the only thing that's going to work for you is AM radio. He didn't say exactly that, but said pretty much the same thing. <laughs> right. yep. uh, so it was a, a, a huge success, right? I mean, national news. I, I saw multiple posts about it uh, all over the place. It definitely made the rounds within the amateur radio sphere. So as a as a byproduct of that, after the the contacts, after the the the, the whole pass occurred, has 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 the club been any different? Have you gotten a lot more members? Has you you get a lot more questions? People reaching out to you like, hey, I don't have a a school. Can I just join your club? I'm not a student. I'm actually a 55 year old man. You know, because <laughs> you just got cool gear. Like what what's what's been since the uh, since the activation. You know, the the excitement inside of the group has been fantastic. I mean, it, it has ramped up, um, you know, inside of the school. I, I definitely know that there has been a lot more interest that has been expressed, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're open to anyone grade seven through 12. Uh, you know, the, the kids have come out in droves, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, but again, it's one of those things where, you know, we've been there, right. And we're going to continue being there. And so this was a step along the path, but it wasn't like the culmination, like this is the end of what we're doing. This is right. like just a thing along the, our, you know, our, our varied journey. Um, yeah, I understood. But at the same time, uh, having an heiress contact at your school is a very prestigious thing. I mean, I, everybody who knows kind of what Eris is all about and, and about amateur radio and particularly setting up a pass with astronauts in their time, it's very yes. prestigious to be able to do what you guys did. And as I understand it, usually Eris brings a lot of the equipment out and they set things up and, and they run a lot of it uh, for a lot of the, the questions that the kids run through. You pretty much, this was all your equipment, right? This is pretty much all you guys doing this and running this? Correct. Yep. I mean, yeah. 
everything from the antennas on the roof to the feed line to the radios to the power supplies the backup station everything um you know every single component of it, of it is is the schools and every single component of it is the students this was their thing they they did it all they are on the roof they're the ones that are you know setting up all of the equipment they are they're the they're the ones right so there's three teachers uh, you know, that three of us that, that advise the group, uh, myself, uh, a gentleman named Alan and a, uh, teacher Elaine and, uh, the three of us, we are, you know, we're always there. We're always doing stuff with the kids, but really it's the kids that drive it. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the things that they love about it is that we're not doing it. They are. That's amazing. That's really impressive. Uh, I got to, I, I read a note. I'm going to come back and ask you, cause I I'm actually, I want to know more about this shack. So you guys stay tuned that are watching. He's going to tell us all about the, the shack that the kids get to operate on. I bet it's probably better than a lot of your stuff at home. <laughs> so to switch gears a little bit, we can come back to the to Eris and it'll probably come up in our in our discussion as we go along. But as an educator, you know, what has been kind of your most successful method for creating interest? And I'll add a little bit to this or maybe we'll we'll take that as a second part. But also just straight like educating, because I, I loved where you went with this. It's like we bought a lot of stuff. And then we had to figure out how to use it. We knew we needed this, but what we didn't have was the was the stick time, the operator time, the radio usage time. So we'll okay. start with the first part: is how what, what do you think is the best method for creating interest in ham radio? All right. So I don't know what the best is. I, I can or your you what, best, what you from your point of view. I will say, you know, what our method has been um, is to really just help the kids to see the possibilities and then let them choose whatever they want to do. Right. So the basic idea of it is that as ham radio is incredibly varied in terms of what people are Huge. interested in, yeah. uh, you know, there's so many different facets to it. The kids are the same way, right? So if I, if we only do what I enjoy doing, then we're going to miss out on a whole lot of kids. If we only do what Alan's interested in, then we're going to miss out on a lot of kids. And the same thing for Elaine, like we, so we don't focus on what we're interested in. We let individual kids drive the decisions about what they're interested in. And when you get 30 kids in a room together, there's going to be some natural groupings, right? So we've got, you know, a few kids that are really interested in, um, you know, DXing, right. And they're really interested in making content contacts. So great. So we, you know, we focus them, we get help them to, to get started. There's going to be a few kids that are interested in contesting. So, okay, let, let's talk about what we could do for contesting. Some kids are just like, yeah, let's build antennas. Let's build stuff. Let's put stuff together. Okay. What can we do for that? And so a lot of times, if you came into our space, what you would see is that it just looks like absolute chaos. We have a proper kids. ham shack. You have right. a proper ham shack. <laughs> It is just, it's, it's, it's a bit of insanity, right? Because you've got kids everywhere from seventh grade to 12th grade, and they are just doing all sorts of crazy stuff all at the same time. Anything from astrophotography to uh, radio astronomy to, you know, DXing to, you know, uh, the live streaming side of it. Like there's all sorts of stuff that's going on. So it's just about what they're interested in. And that's for us, that's what we have found you know, helps to work, right? They're, they're willing to do, to learn other things in order to do the things that they're really interested and passionate about. And, you know, the, the yeah. licensing and all of that just comes along because they're, they're interested in doing the, the really cool big idea. Thing. Yeah. You, you know, oddly enough, um, I, I've asked this question of like presidents of clubs, people who are very active in amateur radio clubs, and they tell me the exact same thing that it's hard for them to dictate what people find interesting in the hobby. So instead of doing that, they say, hey, look, this is potentially what we could be doing. Like, or what we, you know, you want to go do a bunch of potas, or do you want to do a poda and a camp out event? Or do you want to build antennas? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do the, you know, all that other stuff. And you let the members of the club drive it, right? And so that's, it sounds like what you're doing is you're letting the the the, the kids, who it's for them, this is their club, right. uh, drive the activity. And then you have some it sounds like really good hams that can support you uh, that are also teachers, which is really helpful because they're, then they're there and all that stuff. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think a lot of times the, the struggle is that thinking like, okay, well, we're going to do this project as a group together. 
right? right? And so then you become focused on a project. And the reality of it for kids is, at least my experience has been that we cannot have only one project going. If we don't have seven projects going at one time, we're going to be missing out on kids. And right. not just those seven projects, but we have to have seven more in a planned version, like, you know, it's got to be like your syllabus for the year is going to be, we're going to do this. It's going to take us, we think three months, but realistically we got a little fudge factor in there and then you got four more and then staged up other ones. Right. Right. And so we're, we're getting ready to go with that next thing, whatever that next thing is going to be. So, you know, as the kids are talking about, you know, the air is contact in the background, you know, they've been saying, Oh, well, we really want to do stuff with cube sats. And so, okay. So, you know, six months, you know, prior, I'm starting to have a conversation with Alan Johnston, uh, you know, through AMSAT and talking about how do we get this cube sat simulator, you know, queued up and ready to go for January, February. So that way the kids can be ready to go for that once yeah. we're, you know, once we're in place for it. Um, there's there's kind of an also an interesting point here is that you, you've already mentioned it when, when you're getting ready for the Ares contact. You knew that you had to do work. You knew that you had to put, again, that time into using the radio. You took the journey together. Like you as a ham, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you probably didn't do a lot of satellite contacts before this started to build. So you were working with the kids learning with them as almost equals in a lot of ways. And how, how did, how do you think that plays into it or, or does it? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, th- there is no question with my, with my students, right? Like I, I don't pretend to know most of this stuff. Right? I love like this. I don't, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, th- there is, there's no question about that. And they can come to me with questions and I'm probably going to have the same ones. And my answer is always going to be, well, did you look it up? Did you do some research about that? What have the forums said about that? Have you looked in YouTube to see if there's any videos about that? Right. Did you read the manual? You right. know, like, because I don't know either. But you, we're going to figure it out together. Do you have like an engineering background or are you strictly educated teacher kind of, you know? Yep. Strictly teacher. Okay. Because yep. a lot of the things you're saying is like what we always face in engineering is nobody knows how to do this thing yet, but we're all going to kind of have to learn to do it together and we're going to plot it out. You know, we're going to have a, you know, a, a schedule, rough schedule, storyboard kind of thing. And we're going to just what we think we should be at at that point, hopefully, you know, to be gelled right. enough that we can actually stand upon that and keep, you know, making layers of that, that understanding. Uh, this is. So I, I can't say that I think, at least I'll, I'll make my, my statement, I think what you have going is, is fairly unique. I know there are other ham clubs at this grade level, there's no question, uh, but uh, the self-guidedness of it, is this something that the kids just gravitated towards, or did you kind of have to like let go of the reins to allow this to happen? I mean, part of it, it just is born just out of sheer ignorance, right? Like, I, I, I don't know it. Because right? you, like, you didn't I, feel like you had to step in there and say, you're doing right. it wrong. You got to do right. it the right, the ham way, or it's the wrong way, right? Right. So yeah. it was probably about 2010 uh, that I started working with Arduinos. Uh, it was probably around 2012 that I started launching Weather Balloons. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've got experiences that I was able to bring into the sphere and, you know, working with 3d printers and working with technology and always having been around technology and always having a love for it. Um, but in, in regards to the specifics of projects, right. The, 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 the minutia, the, the nitty gritty of all of it in how to do an Ares contact, how to talk to satellites, how to do a lot of the things that we're doing APRS or whatever it might be like the, the details are really, they, they matter a lot. Sure. And so, you know, the, the only way to do it is to do it. Like the only way to learn it is to do it. And, and if you don't have that experience, I can't be up uh, up on stage telling them, oh, well, this is how you, and I'm certainly not going to tell them you have to wait for me to learn it first. Like, heck no. Like you guys are intelligent human beings. You might be teenagers. So, you know, like there's a lot of, you know, hurdles still to, to, to uh, overcome, mm-hmm. but you're capable of, of doing this and figuring it out. So what they need is somebody just to, you know, let them have the space and the time and the 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 resources to be able to do it. So yeah. well, here's the radio and here's this, you know, thing. And you, what else do you need? Like you tell me what you need and I will be your procurement officer. And then 
we'll figure it out from there. I like the I like the I'm there to procure and remove the red tape and you guys could just explore. Right. Uh Dwight T sent a super chat. Thank you Dwight. We'll answer your question. Have you looked into APRS and repeater balloons? It sounds like you already have a balloon background. So what uh have you ever ran APRS or that the kids found out about APRS yet? Yep. So in June of 2023, uh we launched I want to say it was our third high altitude balloon. Um, we, that was our second with APRS on it. And it was our nice. first with amateur TV on it. And so we live streamed from the balloon from the time of launch all the way up to 90,000 feet. Oh, so it's a proper then, sond weather balloon type. Is, is it a, is it a sond, the modified sonds? No, like this is a full payload package. Like, Oh, wow. Okay. Like, this is a this is a you know a, a five six pound behemoth styrofoam container. Oh wow! With, uh, you yeah, know, with a uh, a one uh, one watt uh, amp uh, for a digital TV transmitter that's in there. Oh, that's no joke. Okay, yeah. So like you know w the kids were able to live stream the video all the way up to ninety thousand feet and then back down again all on uh, seventy centimeters all the way you know and track it the entire time using that same antenna system that we had on the roof uh, for the Aris contact to be able to maintain the signal lock for the the amateur TV uh, signal, right. The six megahertz, uh, bandwidth, right. And to be able to, to decode it and then to be able to push it back out on our YouTube live stream. And so, and then they were actually in the field to be able to, to retrieve it. And they, they Skyped that in and they Skyped so, hello balloon calling you from right, Skype. Can you, <laughs> right. so, so we had the, the, the entire live stream was, I don't know, whatever, like four hours long or something. Like oh, that's that. awesome. But, oh, but wait, it, you went, you took it all the way up to, to, to when it pops and then did, all the way back down did you and recover so, it too were yes, you able to so, they, so they were on the live stream when they recovered it right and so they're watching they're like waiting for it to come down and this they've got is their, sweet they've got their radio direction finding antennas like their arrow antennas they're out there looking for the morse beacon you know to find where it is exactly because we wouldn't let them use the aprs that was on it to find it like that would be too easy so right so, oh that's so like, even better yes because so, so then have, it would be gps in there so you literally right. did our our, our uh, radio direction finding to, to yes. do it oh yep. wow so i should i should now i'm putting the the connections together what you did there with the balloon is that a byproduct of some of the funding you got from ardc um so we are not a we have never received anything from ardc Oh, uh, you mentioned something earlier that your proposal was. Uh, what was that? Did I? That did I was separate. Actually, actually, that was that was completely separate. That was something that was like a a different thing altogether. That had nothing to do with amateur radio. Like that had nothing to do with the ARL. Like oh. that was just something years prior to, that okay. we just happened to be able to to stumble our our way into. So you you were uh, still able to fund a lot of because I mean this is this is equipment you have to buy right. the, the 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 all the the transmitters the SSTV devices yep. the weather balloon the helium helium's really expensive. I don't know if you knew this guy's really expensive. Uh, uh, and then now you have the radio direction finding stuff. So is this all like donations? Like how do you fund a lot of this stuff? I I, so, I didn't think to ask this, but I'm I'm hearing the yeah. numbers, but the ham and me is kicking in going uh -huh. well this is not cheap stuff so like if you don't mind you if you if you don't want yeah. to it's okay well, how, how do no, you it's fund fine. a lot of this so it's a it's a combination of a lot of different things so uh, there was uh the one time that we got a grant that allowed us to buy some of that basic equipment so there you know we got the 9700 we got a 7300 at that time mm -hmm. uh, and at that same time we were able to buy the uh like the arrow antennas and yep. uh some of the other base equipment because we had these specific projects in mind at that time not knowing how to do them but knowing that the equipment lists were there so we knew what we should be buying just not how to use it so right. we got a lot of that up front um you know and then progressively as all things have a tendency to to creep in their scope right like there's a lot of other things that you have to buy and so the school has been fantastic in terms of being able to support us annually nice. you know like helping us out being able to buy you know things here and there um you know so like oh we all of a sudden we realize we need some cables okay well we can the school can pitch in and help buy some cables you know okay or you know in the case of um you know some things like our our local uh our local club, you know, Wattsburg Wireless Association, they would come alongside of us and they would say like, yeah, here, you guys needed this? Sure, we, we can help you out with that. 
Uh, and so they pitch in. Um, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. how supportive are the parents in this too? Do they end up chipping in any cash? Because that's what I find out is that like I end like as a as a father to a bunch of kids, I'm throwing cash at like all kinds of different little clubs and projects that the school is trying to put on for this kind of stuff. So do you have that support as well? So we have never asked our parents wow. to to support us in, in in anything in terms of like financial or you know buying equipment or anything like that. We're we're doing our first fundraiser. Well, today was actually our our first official fundraiser um and that was to to be able to buy a telescope because the kids want to do astrophotography as well nice and so they're they're fundraising right now to to do a, a to buy a telescope but a, a good telescope point, isn't cheap so i could understand that right <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and and of course they're not they're not interested in like the walmart version they're like no hey, no hey. well they could use the walmart version but it's not going to be as good it's not going to be no. effective yeah no they, they'll spend they, more time to hook a camera to it and cost in, in mounting structure than get the right thing from the beginning so that, i get that's it exactly yeah so, so gray man so yeah. Oh, sorry, real quick. Gray Man Poda, thank you for five months. Really do appreciate it. And uh, Mitchell's Pilot is back with the Super Chats. Thank you so much. And Colin in the VK, thank you for eight months. Do appreciate you. So go ahead. Continue your thought there. Thanks. Uh, no, I was just going to say, you know, the funding side of all of this is very, very tricky, right? Yeah. And a big part of it for schools is that you we we have to find a way to build it into what the school does to make it a part of what the school expects to do so that way it becomes something that will live on in perpetuity right like if the school invests not just one time but continually and the school builds it up it's not about one person it's not about one it, it lives of- the ham shack lives on Right. Correct. Exactly. And then that's what you want. You don't want it to be about that one teacher that was there. And then when they retired or they took another job, that it ends. You want to do things that are sustainable in nature. And that requires the the school to support it. And so you don't necessarily always want to front load it all with, you know, support and get into fundraising and all of that. Like there's yes to some of that, but at the same time, like, do that enough to be able to build a solid argument that the school should be able to assist in some way, shape or form. Not, and again, everybody's different. Every school is different. Every, you know, and it takes time. You have to be able to do things to be able to justify that too. I I can see this as a double-edged sword. And and ultimately your story is kind of like actually very similar to Steve K5 ATA who's, who's been in the chat. When Steve, you know, went to go work at the AWRL, some of that stuff that he was doing, that he was kind of the the driving force of, or at least the catalyst, catalyst is probably the right word, mm-hmm. to allow the kids to explore, kind of started to slow down because there wasn't someone or hopefully multiple someones to, to pick that up and run with it. And it sounds like in your case, it's not that you necessarily have to be that technically minded or the, the most experienced ham. You just have to be willing to take the journey. Right? Would right. you? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you know, my, my degree is not, I'm not a, I was not a science teacher, right? Like Mm -hmm. uh, that was not my thing. Um, you know, and so we have three of us that are advisors to the club. So it's myself, Alan and Elaine and between the three of us, we, we encompass a lot of, you know, different students, a lot of different groups of students that we typically work with, but having three of us is the, the, the key part of that. Because again, if any one of us has to go for any reason, you know, yeah. the, the program is going to continue on, right. It's going to still thrive. And so then it's about figuring out who the, who the next person is to come alongside of the two to be able to continue it on or come alongside the three to continue it on. more. I, I have to bring you back as you further flesh that out, because I think that's the crux that so many uh, school based clubs have is that the, there's usually a teacher that's the the catalyst and there's not a good transfer of power the transfer of the initiative to another teacher or hopefully a group of teachers so i'm really interested in that because honestly i I have the same problem in engineering like i'm an engineering manager i try to 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 mesh younger engineers with more senior engineers to to do that knowledge transfer and it's always incredibly difficult we don't have good ways to make that happen so if you figure that out you got to come back we got to talk about it seriously because it's really important 
you know, and the same thing is true for for local clubs as well, and pretty much all nonprofits, right? Like you have yeah. to be able to find good people to be able to come alongside that have you know a connected vision, right, or a connected passion to then be able to let them run with it and have ownership of it, and to be able to you know bridge it into the next phase of whatever it is. How are they going to elevate it? How are they going to, you know, bring that program into the next, you know, realm or sphere or whatever it is that, you know, will help the kids to do something else great. Yeah, it's very well said. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're totally spot on, but I, I'm going to hold you that. you got to come back. Uh, Andy, Andy Callie, three years supporting the Ham Radio Crash Course. Uh, Andy is on all the live streams. He's always the first one in, last one out. So we, we really do appreciate Andy. I know you are there in all our live streams, so that's awesome. So to, to change gears a, a step, we've been talking about a lot of what you've been able to facilitate with a lot of the students that are in your school. What's your favorite radio activity? <laughs> uh, do you even have okay. time to do your uh, own radio activity? Or are you just out there helping the kids all the time? <laughs> so, so, so that's tough because I, I mean, truly it's whatever, it's whatever causes that light bulb bulb to go off for the kid. Right. Like that's, that's what I love doing. Right. Yeah. Like, sure. Yeah. I mean, I could be here at the house and I could be on my radio and I could be doing my thing, which fine, whatever. I enjoy it. But seeing kids do something that then all of a sudden, you know, clicks for them. That's what I absolutely love in all of it. Um, and because again, it's, it's hands on, right. It is something where they can do something of substance. I, then I have to I have to adjust this question slightly. Where did you get your passion for educating? Where did that come from? Because I, I honestly like I've talked to a lot of teachers, right? And not just the teachers that I my kids work with, but like teachers that are involved with amateur radio and all that. What you just answered the question is like again giving back to the kids. Like that's where did that where did that come from? It, from you? From your your I don't know your upbringing your your background? What is it? <laughs> Uh, that's a, okay. So that's a great question. I, yeah, that is a bit I, rare. I have I to say that is that answer. I did not expect that. I expected like, I like to do a poda every once in a while, like, you know, that kind of thing. Like, <laughs> right. Right. Um, uh, you know, again, I think inherently, um, you know, we, we all have different strengths, right? Like there's things that we naturally gravitate towards. And for me, uh, you know, building something, creating things, uh, is something that I love to do. And it doesn't really matter to me what it is in particular that we're building or creating, as long as it's something of substance, something that brings joy, something that, you know, uh, adds substance to the world in a, in a, in some sense, or, you know, and so I think it was probably around seventh grade or so, uh, I read Booker T Washington's, uh, autobiography and, you know, hearing and reading that was not that, required learning. reading. <laughs> That was not right. required so, reading. So, <laughs> so, but for me, what that was, was like, I got to hear and, you know, his experience with building a school, right. Okay. And his experience with what it was like to build this transference of knowledge and to build in other people that joy and love of learning. Right. And I, that was one of the things that just resonated with me. Like, oh yeah, clearly. Like I, I you know, whether it was the token ring network that my, you know, tech director and I were party working we were on, talking about, yeah. or whether it was, right, exactly. Whatever it was, I, I, I just love doing things and building it inside of a school setting seemed to make a lot of sense to me. And it still does. I, I really truly think that there's a lot of good inherent in education. And if we just, get our adult selves out of the way a lot of times the good stuff can just naturally flow because because the kids the kids know what they want sometimes a lot of times yeah. they want to do something cool and so do we we want to do cool things too well no it, it's really interesting though because like what you said is oh i just like to build things but it it it's not i like to build things too but it's largely things that i do for myself that i'm building for my own interest and enjoyment you're building things but through the facilitating others, particularly younger people in, in education to do it, that is rare. The, the, like everything I'm hearing from you right now is is more on the, the rare side of education than I get to experience. So I, I have to say kudos. It's, it's really fantastic. So I, I will say this. I, I think I, I think that I am not rare. 
I think that there is a lot of others out there. I drew, truly, I do. I think that I'm not unique in a lot of senses. Like, I think there's a lot of us out there that are trying to navigate a really complicated system. And we go into it with the passion to do this. And a lot of times life and bureaucracies and other things can stymie that uh, you know, that passion yeah. and we can't necessarily navigate and figure out how to give it an outlet to give it, you know, a, a natural growth process. And so, you know, for instance, uh, you know, I, I got to meet a lot of wonderful people at the, the teachers Institute from the ARRL. And then, uh, Eris, uh, hosted a, a sparky workshop, which I got to go to, which was fantastic as well. And so I met a lot of wonderful teachers and even just this week, um, Steve Goodgame introduced me to a gentleman named Everton who is on Staten Island that's doing some fantastic things, right? Like, and, you know, seeing and hearing what these other teachers are, are doing around the country is incredibly inspiring because a lot of times they're succeeding despite a system that can oftentimes stymie that creativity and uh, that has a lot of roadblocks into in it. And so... Um, you know, more power to them, right? Like more power to their ability to push their way through and find success where a lot of times it, it is tough to to make that headway. That's again, very impressive. You're, you're very impressive to me in, in, in your passion for, for educating, which is just obvious, I think. Uh, Rod Murray, uh, retired teacher here, would have been fantastic working at, day, at Drew's school. His enthusiasm is infectious, thinking about our club to have a school outreach from VA3. So we got a Canadian in the house, MZD. So yeah, I, I, yeah your energy in this is just unparalleled, I think. How, how do you find the, 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 the continuation of that energy? That's a hypothetical question. If you actually know the answer, please put it in a bottle and ship it to me because I need more of it. <laughs> Look, you, when you hang out with teenagers all of the time, like you've got to rise to their level of mm -hmm. energy, which a lot of times is far beyond what is native at, at my age to be able to do. Um, and so, like, but again, it's not just me, right? Like if I was trying to do this by myself, I would not be able to, to be successful with it. Right. Yeah. Like it is a, co it is a combination of so many people. It is a combination of, you know, Steve Goodgame. It is a combination of Joe Garcia at the ARRL It is a combination of all of the folks at Eris, uh, Alan and Elaine at my school, you know, and all of the others that are, you know, Rick Cutter and, uh, Ron Reisick and Larry Kemmler, all these other guys that are local here, right. That are, that are doing so much for us to be able to support us. Like, it is a village effort. And mm -hmm. because if you, and, and here, I'm sorry, I'm going to go on one little tiny tangent here. No, man, go for it. Right. Well, so, you don't mind going over the hour because I still got a question and, and we, okay. we, I want to take some questions for the chat. If you don't mind, well, I'm happy to go no, longer. Good. Yeah. So, so the thing about schools is that it's, it's a scale issue, right? It's, the problem is that like right behind me here, you know, I've got my, you know, I've got my 705, 7300. We're going to ask right. about that. We're going to, we're right. getting to that. So, we're getting to so that. Like, I, I can have my setup here at home and that's nice and that's fine. And that's good. It's a scale of one, right? Like I use it and my kids use it. Right. So mm -hmm. they, they, they've got their licenses. They get on it. They do their things with it, but at home it's easy. It's a scale of one. But when you have 30 students in a classroom, and you've got 30 kids that all want to do stuff and you've got one radio and you've got one setup. It is incredibly problematic because what happens is that the kids want to get on there and they can't, they've got to wait their turn essentially. And that turn might be how will take, you know, how long, do you, how long are you typically on the radio for? Right? Like if you're, if you're making contacts or you're doing a thing, yeah. you know, even if you're just setting it up for FT8 or you're setting it up for, you know, doing APRS or whatever you're trying to do, the setup time, the doing it time, then the resetting it for something else time, right? Like, one radio is really, really hard to work with in a school setting. Like it's, it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. Like, yes, but the scale of the problem is so much greater at a school, because if you don't capture those kids in the time that you have them, then you're going to land up losing them. There's enough other competing interests that are out there that they can mm. gravitate towards. And so we have to think about things just like, no, it's not okay to get a, a 7,300. Like that's the starting point. And it's not okay just to get 
um, you know, one uh, arrow antenna because that arrow antenna was wonderful, but it only works when you're comfortable going outside and you've got supervision and you can, you know, happen to coordinate with the pass of the satellite. That thing that sits up on the roof that does the as L, right? Like that you can use all year round, snow, rain, wind, like anything else. That's the side yeah. of it that becomes clutch in terms of scaling it to make it more, you know, accessible to the kids. So I totally understand what you're saying, because I was a petulant little child that, you know, I, I always wanted to be the one with the red ball, not the yellow ball at P.E. Right. Or if you only have so many soldering irons or only have so many radios or, you know, whatever, right. you, you, you have to be able to distribute that in some way. Have you looked into SDRs at all, like distributed radio yes. users and all that? Yeah. Where are yes. you going with that or, or where are you at? So 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 we use SDRs for a bunch of different things right okay. now. Um, and so just turn, talking about like understanding the, the value that radio brings, right? Like the Ares contact was fantastic. Wonderful. Everything about it and everything that Ares does is wonderful. Scaling it up to the point of being able to give more and more kids access to it. Um, you know, our school just is about to go through renovation process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we said, Hey, look, we would really, really like to be able to have more dedicated radio space. Because right now we can only get two or four kids on a radio at any one time. And that's really not a great system. And so we got a, a room uh, dedicated to us that's adjacent to our current room that's gonna be dedicated to having seven stations set up simultaneously. So we have seven different booths that will all be set up simultaneously. So okay. we're going to have like, 14 kids that can get on radios at any given time once this is all said and done. So like the school has given us the, the space to be able to get to the point of being able to do that. Um, but like so the SDRs is a huge part of being able to listen in, understand what you're processing or, you know, uh, decoding essentially the, you know, like the AX25 data that's coming from the satellites, the, you know, green cubes, whatever, you know, whatever's up green, there. That, are, yeah. Are you doing green cube yet? Are you so, getting there? Yeah. So, yeah. And so like, there's so many things that you can do, even if you just have the SDRs. And so, but even the SDRs require that you have computers set up for it. Right. right. And so, Again, it's all a scaling thing. So the Yagi you guys put up, is it multi-band HF or do you have multi-band capability? Um, so we have a vertical, a Hustler 6B TV vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have multi-band on that one. And then the Yagi that we just put up is straight 10 meters. Um, and then we did that for the all of the techs, right? So that way they can get... Uh, yes. A different kind a of taste. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taste right, with, their, with their little sliver of 10 meters that they're allowed. Right. Uh, so like multiplexers, have you looked into multiplexers? Cause then you could break out, you know, that are, did you already have that? I, I want to no, ask, okay. No, we, do, we don't have it. That's definitely something that we want to do. And we know that we have to get to that point. Um, you know, we are certain we're getting, like, it's one of those things. I know that in 10 years from now, in a decade from now, we're already, we're, we've got this, it's, it's done, right? Like this is, this is inevitable at this point that we will have all of this. We're going to have a super station type thing going on. All right. And like kids are going to be able to have a lot of access to it. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of now we just have to do it right. Like we just have to do the work to make that a reality, but it's coming. So yeah. yes, multiplexers. Absolutely. I, I love that. I love that. So then let, let, we'll bring it back to you for a second. And, and yes, this is a question for you. Okay. <laughs> Not just facilitating others, which I think is wonderful, but what is your favorite radio to date? Oh, Isn't that oh, the best ham radio question ever? Oh. It's, it, it's the hardest one. It's like, pick your favorite child. Okay. What's, who is your favorite child? So uh, that might be an easier question. I, I mean, well, the child <laughs> or the radio? Yeah, I think I think. <laughs> You know what? I think no. you're right. <laughs> no. Um, so, I mean, I, I have to give, uh, you know, to give it to the, the 7300. It, it is yeah. hard. To, it is a such a versatile radio. Uh, for, for HF, it's hands down, 
you know, a great introductory radio. It's solid all the way around, um, you know, for the schools, it's great, uh, you know, to, to be able to just get up and running with it very quickly and easily. I love my 705 doing soda with that. Um, you know, that just makes it a thousand times easier than, than lugging the 7,300 up the mountain. But, you know, um, my hat's off to those that do that. Uh, I, I, I like the answer. Good right. answer. Good answer. Seven oh five is still my my favorite radio because you could do everything with it. You you can pretty much hit all the bases with it. Not well, not so much the satellites because it's not completely full duplex like the ninety seven hundred is. But well, yeah, no, I, I I'm with you. As I have heard it said that QRP is for heroes. Um, <laughs> yes, <you know. laughs> we do say um, that. My wife does yeah. anyway. Right. So I, I, I love this, the 705, it, but, you know, again, it's one of those things that on day to day use 7300, that's where it's at for me. Right on, right on. Uh, it, so here's here's we'll probably wrap up this question because we're at the top of the hour here. If you had unlimited funds and manpower, what approach would be the best way to grow the amateur radio community? Now, I, I, I will I will caveat that is that's very wide, the entire community. But I think everything you've said is like here here's the car here's all the things we could do, putting it on the on the, the whiteboard. You guys pick. That's universal. That's a universal constant. Whether it's adults, kids, whatever, there you go. And and there's no wrong answer to this, <laughs> of course. So just explore the space. So it would be really easy to say that given unlimited money and resources that, you know, you do EME or you would do satellite work, or you would do any of the things that are more difficult or more expensive to do. I think that if I was given unlimited money and unlimited resources, what I would love to see happen is I would love to see more and more schools get into amateur radio. And the reason why I say that is because the more schools that do something, the more schools that will do something. So if we could get 500 schools to be really committed in amateur radio and to be doing truly wonderful, awesome things with amateur radio, then what we would turn around and see is that every single one of those schools will have an influence on another school, a neighboring school. And the effect of that will be that those schools will then have an effect. And we haven't quite hit, I don't think that tipping point yet where we will have a complete snowball effect where it will become inevitable that you know, we're going to have this giant mass of schools come on board, but I think we're really, really close. And if I had unlimited resources and money, honestly, what I would be doing is I would be throwing it all at Steve Goodgame and at the ARRL and at ARIS and their Sparky program. And I would be saying, invest there because they are the ones that are going to create in the long term, the vision I think a lot of us have, which is that this becomes a inherent natural part of the school system. And if we can, if we can, you know, focus our collective efforts on them that turn around and focus their collective efforts on the schools that are going to thrive, right. That are not going to make it a, a one and done or a one trick pony or anything like that, that are actually going to make it sustainable. If we could figure out how to invest or if they can do that, then we will see the natural growth process come because schools love to compete. Schools do not want to be an island unto themselves. They don't love doing things that are unique. They don't. That's not what schools do. They want to know that they are solidly in the middle of all of the things that all of the other schools are doing. Nobody wants to be at the vanguard of it. At least most schools do not, right? And so if we can invest in the schools that are doing things and are the tip of the spear and that have taken that leap already, then those schools will by their very nature proliferate that out to other schools. Other schools will look at them and say, it's not a risky proposition to be able They've to go down. Done it. Radio thing. Yes. They've done it. They, they have success with it. And so we can emulate them. We don't have to completely build the whole curriculum. We don't have to build everything brand new. We can work off of what they've already done. And then we can do this too. 
So yeah. if I had limited funds and resources, that's where I'd be putting it right back to right back to them. And, and no, that's not a paid promotion. I'm not getting anything as a result of it. Truly, honestly, that's where I feel like I would do it because I'm seeing the return on that investment already. Yeah, I, I'm not either. But I will say again, Teachers Institute, I'll drop the link. And, and everybody watching, this isn't necessarily a link for you. This is a link for an educator you know that would be interested in something like going to the Teachers Institute. They pretty much pay for everything, and you get gear, and you get a sil well, it's it's like a lot of different parts that you could add to a syllabus that would be included in STEM learning at the Teachers Institute. I dropped the link in the chat, and I'll put it in the show notes. This is like, yeah, you, you're I I I can't I I do not disagree with anything you've said. Go ahead, go ahead. You're gonna say so, something. So like I, again, I cannot stress this enough. One of the biggest Please. takeaways that I had from the Institute was knowing that I was not alone, that Alan, Elaine, and I were not alone, that what we were trying to do was not in isolation. And when you have that moment where you realize like, ah, this isn't my random crazy idea, that there's a lot of other people out there that also see this and know this is good and valuable, and we just have to build the momentum for it. And there is a relief that comes from that. There's also a tremendous amount of um, empowerment that happens as a result of knowing that you're not trying to do it by yourself, right? Like it can feel absolutely overwhelming for a teacher in a random school because there's there's 24,000 senior high schools in the United States, right? 24,000. And if you are that one teacher at one of those schools and you're doing this and not a single other school is doing it within 500 miles of you, you win. You can, right. Like <laughs> you can feel like this is maybe this isn't where I should be putting all of my effort into, but it is, it's worth it. It's just a matter of finding those other people and then growing that base. So I, I'll poke at that a bit. Cause I, this is a really good, uh, this is like a local thing. Like out here, the competition for cool programs is like through the roof. Uh, so have you had other educators reach out to you to like learn what you did or, or parents of kids to say like, Hey, this is freaking amazing what you've been able to accomplish. How do I do what you did? Yes, absolutely. And the great part of it is, is that it's because the path has been worn already, we can transfer that knowledge fairly seamlessly. Everybody's experience yeah. is going to be a little bit different with it. And the learning curves are all still there. But the the knowledge that you can get to that point, it is a doable thing and it is not unattainable. It's not so remote of an idea that they can do it with some guidance, with some help, with some support structures in place, with amazing people at the ARRL, with some amazing people at ARIS, with the support of a local, you know, ham radio club. You know, it is possible to do these things. And the more knowledge that we build in it, the more that it will continue on. I, I read a really great article uh, recently that was talking about like, hey, we, you know, why is it that, you know, we're doing all of this stuff with the moon now? And, you know, what's, you know, why now? And then also, um, you know, like, why why are we not just replicating what we did in the Apollo era? Right? Oh, you're dipping into my world, so I can't wait to hear this. Go for it. <laughs> well, well the, be the beauty of the article was that basically it summed up in, in saying like, look, there is a knowledge that comes from experience. And that knowledge that came from experience in the Apollo era didn't completely transfer over through the decades, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to do things in order to have some experience with it, to be able to fully grasp and fully understand it. And so we're relearning a lot of the things that they were doing. Now we're relearning with all new technology and we're relearning it with a lot of, uh, you know, new and, um, you know, greater understanding, but the experiential knowledge of things is where for schools, once we start to do it, and we and more start to do it, then we will be able to, you know, continue it on in perpetuity without as much difficulty. There isn't there isn't this giant gap of time and experience. So I, I want to add something to this because I found this video completely fascinating, and and you may you may really like this as well. So uh, Destin, smarter every day, he did a video where he talked uh, to NASA, or or it wasn't NASA, it was a it was a council of people who create the architecture for 
this type of space travel, right? Because if everybody understands correctly, the the shuttle was designed to put satellites into orbit. It wasn't designed to go to the moon. Apollo was a much, much larger flight vehicle than, than the space shuttle was designed to be. It had a completely different mission. Getting into different altitudes, distances from the Earth is an incredibly confounding problem. And Destin over at Smarter Every Day and his video on I Was Scared to Say This to NASA was really, really good. And uh, I, I, too, am interested in this because, you know, from my point of view, from an engineering standpoint, it's like, what more science can we get from going back to the moon? There's not a whole lot of science, right? We, 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 we collected the rocks. We did the things. But now it's the technology has advanced so much that now we're looking at different orbiting patterns of how we can get into orbital placement on the moon, how we can use low Earth orbit type of refueling, which is something that's never been achieved before, which would be part of the Artemis mission. That is like that is a step into humanity being able to expand its footprint into the cosmos, which is it is a fantastic time to be alive because that's so interesting that literally, so, by the way, which is a really funny throwback, if you ever watch the movie Armageddon, there's a part that just as an engineer, I was like, oh, this is, they had to do this. They're, they they land and they refuel in space because you would have to consider doing that in those situations unless you're going to carry all of that fuel. But if you carry all of that fuel, it limits your orbiting mechanics and capabilities. So it was, I, it's such a pop popcorn movie. There was some engineering stuff that just killed me, but Drew, you're, you're champing at the bit. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, a couple of days ago as the, uh, the intuitive machines, you know, lander, uh, yes. Odysseus, you know, and we had a big right. moon landing. Uh, the Americans had a big moon right. landing too. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. So we, so my kids, uh, my, my school have a discord, right. And, and so they're watching it, we're watching it. Everybody's watching it live. Right. And then, you know, the, the, the touchdown should happen. Right. Yeah. And, and then you hear in mission control, them start to talk about, well, we're trying to get signal acquisition. Yes. Right. And then they start to talk about like, well, we are going to transfer over to, you know, this dish, which ground station is going to pick it up. And it was like, yes, like, that's it guys. Like, we cannot necessarily, as a school, put the things we we can't like launch the rocket, right? We may be able to get a thing on the rocket, but we can't launch the rocket, right? But but, but all of that ground system stuff, the telemetry, all, of, all the that data, all let's that, get it. Right, yeah. we can do that. Like that's how we can connect in. But then when you hear the professional saying like, oh, we got to switch over to the, the giant 40 meter dish that is, you know, hanging out in Australia and we're going to wait for, you know, 13 hours for it to be, you know, in range. It's like, guys, look, we might be, not be able to do a 40 meter dish, but we can do a four and a half meter dish. We yep. can do 15, you know, 15 feet. And we can and there's do different, like there's different antennas that you can build. I mean, uh, uh, the the corner antenna, the edge antennas that they use to, to, to get the original moon landing. Right. Those guys built that in their backyard and they were some of the first people that received signals from the moon right. before anyone else did. Which is just like you could do this, kids. Like you could make this happen, which is yes. so much fun. Yeah. Yes. Oh, absolutely. it's a great, great point. Great point. So the, the professional, yeah. the professionals, right? Like these are people that have spent their lives and are, you know, doing this with huge you know, arrays with, of, with of giant, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. giant sums of money, right? Yeah. But it's the same thing. Same it's mechanics. The same idea, right? Yeah. Like so, if we can, if we can have our little taste of that experience too, like all the better for the kids to be able to set them up to say, yeah, heck yeah, I'm going to go to college and I'm going to explore something I'm passionate about. Whether And 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 if it's in engineering, awesome. Yeah. Great. But you know what? Even if it's not, they're going to take a ton of technical skills and logic and computational awareness and all of those other critical thinking skills. And they're going to take it to whatever they want to do. And they're going to have access to a hobby for the rest of their lives that they can just come back to at any moment if they don't you know, intuitively stay with it forever. So that's a wonderful point. Great point. Uh, Sean asks, do you share your lesson plans? Is there a class project slash website link, whatever? What do you got? 
Uh, uh, that's a great question. So I, I will say this. So Alan, uh, KC3, I think it's TGY, Tango Golf Yankee, uh, he, he teaches a wireless technology class at our school. He just started it, teaching it this year. And I will, ch I could check with him about that. Um, I know for our after school group, like we have no lesson plans. Our right. lesson plans are walk into that room and do whatever they want to do okay. and figure it out. That's, that's our plan for any given day. Um, the class project website link, um, the kids uh, are starting to put that together right now, as far as to be able to distribute that. So uh, I would say, look on our YouTube channel, uh, the ATG YouTube channel, and that's going to be coming up sometime, probably in the next like month, month and a half that we're going to start putting all of that stuff out there. I love it. So there is a selfish question, not not selfish necessarily, but personal question. What is the radio behind you? Tell us about your shack. So I think we already said 7300 and 705. What else you got going on brewing back there? Uh, all right. So what do I have got? I've got the 705, the 7300, uh, an ICOM 2-meter radio. I've got the radio that started it all for me, which is a, a, a Radio Shack home base CB there it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, circa 1987 or something like that. Um, and then what else? I've got a, an Anytone 878. I've got the ham radio workbench uh, power distribution system. Up nice, there. nice, nice. Um, yeah, that's that's most of what I've got going on here. Man. Uh, so I think that's. Oh, well, thank you. Wait, where was it? There it is. W5SWXS, one of the best videos on HRCC. So, I mean, thank you, Drew. That That's a largely to the, the passion, really, the energy. I, I I noticed that on Mike's stream. I was like, oh, this man is, there's no one more passionate about this than anyone I've talked to. Uh, I, it, it's very impressive. So I, I just thank you for, for being out there and doing what you do. I don't know if you get that enough from people, but you definitely deserve to hear it. Well, I, I will say this, I, you know, it is a joy. It is a privilege to be able to, to do it. And I say that and with all sincerity, because I get to work with a lot of great people in this process, right? Like it is not just me, right? Like I, truly not at all, just me. I mean, between my, the teachers that I work with, uh, the co-advisors, the, the people at the ARRL, like, again, just as a, just as an example, right? Like, of course, of course. Right. Yeah. I have no idea how we're setting this as L system up on our flat roof, <laughs> right, right? Right. Like yeah. with, without a, uh, without a Roan tower segment on the roof. Like I have no idea how this is going right, to work. Right. And I have no idea how to sell this to my maintenance department that we're not going to destroy our roof and, you know, put holes in it and everything else. And, and, but like something like that, like I reached out to uh, Joe Garcia at the ARRL and he's like, Hey, look, we've got this. We've already got this sitting up on one of our roofs. Let me take, he took videos of it and he showed me exactly how it was all set up and how it was all laid out. And so again, I don't do this in isolation. I do none of it in isolation. It is all a gigantic team effort. And our Elmers, like anybody out there that is an Elmer, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because we have some amazing Elmers uh, around here. Um, Rick Cutter in particular, who comes out all the time and he is my Elmer, but he is the school's Elmer as well. Like he will help all of us at any given moment with anything. Uh, but the rest of the guys at the local club, like my goodness, the amount of time and energy that they have given to us is, is unbelievable. So like, if you're one of those people that are giving your time to help others, like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because it needs all of us. Truly, it does. So there's a question. A couple of them have come up. Is is there like a donation for your school or anything like that? I I should have asked you beforehand. Sometimes we do these live streams and I never think like people are going to ask this. But, you know, yeah, this is a good question. Is there a, a way people can donate? Look, I, I am always like, that's such a strange question. Like It I, is, right? I know it, it feels surreal. Feel when, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, the reality of it is yes, uh, there is. Okay. Um, you can, I, I, what I would say is if you can reach out to me through uh, QRZ, through my email that's on there, that's probably the best way of, of getting me. Um, and then we can, you know, we can do it through however works for you. Um, and, and thank you. Because again, like every little bit of it helps, right? We, we, we do not do this in isolation, but at the same time, like we can't do it without stuff too. Like the kids, 
the kids want to do these things and without the things to do it, they just get stuck. Right. Like we all do. And it's, it's true for all of us, but when you have parents, like not a single one of my students is a second generation ham, not a single one. Wow. Okay. So, you know, all of them are, you know, this is their first foray into it and all of their families, this is now their first foray into it. And so when I'm talking to the parents about the FCC licenses and the equipment, and we do like, we do a loaning system at our school for the equipment. So like the kids can take the equipment home, like they could take, uh, so we had, uh, like, a uh, two, we had an HF radio that was donated that the students can then take home with them. And so they could set it up at home. They could take it home for a few months. They can use it at home. They can get that experience, you know, but like, again, all of it happens because people are willing to give. And, and I, I'm genuinely very thankful for every single person that's, that does that. So thank you. Man, true. This is your your energy is infectious. I wish wish we could bottle it and figure out how to distribute it across the country to all the teachers. Somebody uh, who was it? I gotta find. Uh, yeah, th- this is a good one. David says, "Can you teach at my kid's school?" <laughs> so you ready to take this Bring on the on. road yet? <laughs> Bring it on. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, oh, there's a good question. Uh, did some of the parents also get their licenses? No, not yet. That has been a topic that has come up. None of the parents have yet. What I will say about our parents is that they are wonderfully supportive in the sense that they get it. They understand that this is super valuable to the kids, right? Mm -hmm. The heiress contact was their, you know, winning states, right? Like, right. It's like CIF championship type stuff. Yeah. hundred percent. Championship moment, right? Like that was gigantic for them. But any given week, we have things that are that they are very, very supportive of. So, like, for instance, you know, getting that Yagi up on the 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 roof this week, right? Kids are staying after. Here in Erie PA, it's really cold. I was and, gonna say, yeah. You know, oh my weeks, gosh. We totally forgot to show the pictures. <laughs> we haven't even got to pictures yet. Uh, Go ahead, finish, so, finish. We're gonna do the right. pictures. But like, but like the kids are doing this. They'll do it in the snow. Like they're going up onto the roof. They're they're putting stuff up. They're doing things in the snow. They're readjusting. They're aligning stuff. They're willing to put all of the, all of the time and the effort into it. And the parents are always there saying, "Whatever you need, please let us know. Yeah. We will help." Like, please, you know, and some of the parents are engineers. Some of the parents are lawyers or doctors. Most of them, uh, they're just regular people just doing regular things too. And they're like, we're not like some affluent school or anything like that. We're a completely normal school. Like, completely normal. Uh, Don't Uh, sell your, uh, as the takeaway of this live stream, you should probably not sell yourself short. This is exceptional what you're doing. No, no. So, but, but we're, we are all we might be doing something that is exceptional at this moment in time. Yeah. We are not exceptional in the sense that we are, we are not different than every other school that is around. Sure. We have the same people, the same skill sets, the same abilities, and everyone has the capability of doing this. We're just, we're just hitting a stride with it. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing in and of itself, but everybody's going to be able to get there. And that's our goal. Like we don't want to do this by ourselves. We want all of the other schools to do it. We want them to see it. And then we want them, we want to help them learn how to do it. We want to have them get the grants to be able to do it because we won't need that forever. You know, a lot of the stuff with radio is, you know, like these radios back here, these should last for 20 years or more. Sure, Absolutely. Yeah. And so like that initial upfront investment That should carry us for a long time. And a lot of the new stuff, whether it's FT8 or FT4 or, you know, whatever the new modes are that will come out, a lot of times it's using the same stuff that we already have, just in a different way. So, but but the parent side of it is that our parents are picking those kids up at six o'clock at night after being there for- Wow, yeah. they're, 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 we have wonderful, wonderful support. That parents. is that is pretty fantastic. You want to share a couple of your favorite pictures because that was definitely something on our list, and then we'll probably wrap it up yes. from there. But this has been uh, just amazing talk with you, uh, Drew. Really do appreciate you taking the time. I'll find my mouse here. Let's go. Yeah, we, we, we yeah. All right. <laughs> we're we're testing right. we're testing things live. <laughs> All right, so it says host is disabled oh. participant oh, screen. See, this theory. is why we check this out beforehand. There you go. Now you should be good. All right, let's see what I can do here. All right, I'll All get right. myself out of the way. <laughs> All right, so 
you know, we, this is, uh, this is one of our students, uh, Sadie, this is her building, uh, one of the antennas that we use for the Ares contact. This is some of our students working on, uh, an astrophotography mount that we have, um, uh, a weather station. We've got one young man that is, is really, really into weather stations and doing all things weather. Um, this was us when we were uh, working on the Hustler 6B TV and getting that all prepped out and, and ready to go, making contacts, right? You know, and, and just. Oh, I it love it. Is. Put it on the whiteboard. Show yeah. it off. I like it. Um, so, so this one, so here they're, they're testing, right? And we've got our VEs that came in to do the testing. And if you note back up here on the wall, we have our wall of call signs. And. I don't know if you could see that or not. Yeah, well, I, I see wall of call signs, but I believe you that there's call so, signs in there. So yeah. every brick here has the student's name, the the date that they got their tech, the date they got their general, the date that they get their extra. And so everybody gets a brick, right, when you pass the test. That's and amazing. so for all of these kids, and this has grown now, right? Like if I had an updated picture, it's out here and over here now. And so... You know, it's one of those things. The kids they want their they want their name up on the wall, you know, because that's going to live on. Like that's their this is their place, right? Um, you know, working with some uh, with Raspberry, Raspberry Pi. Pi, doing some programming for that, um, some more builds, some you know uh, balloon stuff. Um, here, let me show you these. That's so super cool. These are some of our antennas. So this is the Yagi that we just put up this week. That's the ten meter, right? Yep, that's the ten meter. Um, this, uh, these are two of our seniors, uh, Ben and Bryce, and, uh, they, uh, we had a, uh, uh our local Elmer that, uh, gave us his, he took it down from his to put it to, to, let oh, it, put it's it, so it cool. Out. It is a, uh, a 1296. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's the 23 centimeter, uh, antenna. So we oh, made 23 centimeters, 23, 23 yeah. centimeter. Yeah. Uh, so we made our very first, uh, 1296 contact, which was great. Uh, that's the actual as L system that we have that the kids built. I'm right? jealous. What, what's the rotor? Is it a 5,500? Yep. The ASU 5,500. Yep. I got to get one of those. Oh, it's glorious. I know. I know. It's glorious. <laughs> I know. There's our vertical, uh, you know, and again, one of the, the, one of the beautiful things about schools is that we have space, right? Most schools have. Oh yeah. Roof. Look at all this roof space you got. Right. It's amazing. Right. Right. With, with all of that room for it's radio. all metallic radiation material underneath you too. So it's right. a good ground exactly. Plane. That's yeah. exactly it. So, you know, and there's our pass through, right? So, all Oh, you got a, Oh, look at that. Oh, I'm so uh -huh. I'm jealous of that now. Now I, I wasn't jealous before, but now I'm jealous. Look at that pass through guys for coax. Look at all those feed lines. They got running into the, their, their space. That's impressive. You know what? And you can see some of the... the and they're doing it in there. the snow. Look at these kids. Right. It's cold, right. and they're out there making it happen. That's amazing. Just for reference purposes, on this particular day, it was 15 degrees. Oh, here. look at that. No gloves. They literally <laughs> just have, like, two layers on. My yep. kids would be dead. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and again, like, one of the things, like, our school, super supportive. We've got cameras uh, that are tied into the, like, the security Oh, yeah, there's a school. camera. Oh, uh, and so man. we can we can see our antennas at any given time. So that way we know that everything is still up. Everything is still operational. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like if all of a sudden our SWR is going wonky, well, we can quickly look and see, is it down or we can go up on the roof. Yeah. A camera is really ladder, helpful for that. You know, this ladder yeah. right over here uh, goes to a hatch that is on the roof that allows us to go right up to it from our radio room, which is right below here, which is, it's pretty uh, I will say it's pretty fantastic that they let the kids up on the roof because I know a lot of schools would be like, there's no way you're letting kids up on this roof. So, again, it's one of those things where, you know, you can train the kids. So, uh, Alan, one of our um, uh, one of the advisors to the group is a volunteer firefighter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we are huge on the safety aspect of all of this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every antenna that we're putting up, we're running that calculator for the radiation and we're making sure that we're paying attention to all of that side of it, you know training the kids on how to go up a ladder safely, right? Because it's a straight vertical ladder. Now, granted, it's only like 10 feet, so it's not like some great distance or anything. But, but still, but, most schools wouldn't even allow this, so that's just awesome. You know, so, um, yeah, just, just a lot of good things that are going on.
Do you want to share any more or go ahead and remove the screen share so you can get back into full share. frame? Man, yeah. Drew, this has been awesome. I think you uh I think you have su sufficiently made other parents jealous of the education program that you guys are all working with. But I, I agree with you that you've now you're like the first not the first, but you're one of a oh. few wagon carts that have gone down the path. And now we're starting to form those grooves and we just need people that know that this exists and then then can do this for themselves and it, I, the shout out would be to the teachers institute really absolutely avail yourselves and and this is this is for the the parents that are watching and everybody else link is in the description for the awrl teachers institute and what they can offer a teacher that is interested in going down this road they can do this and the awrl will bring them out there's a little bit of money they have to put in as a bit of skin in the game. I think it's like hundred dollars, and that's mm -hmm. it to get the get the juice flowing, if you will. And they'll walk out with not just an amateur radio centric STEM program, but the tools and the knowledge that could go into many other projects, which I think is vital and and what kids are really yearning for. So, Josh, I saw a question come through the chat, or yeah. a statement come through the chat, and, and it, it was from uh, David Wilson. He said, uh, just inspired me to reach out to our local schools to see how I can help, which is wonderful. Do it. Yes, do it. If you, if you do not make headway, do not be surprised or shocked or that's, even dismayed yeah. by that. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's okay. Most schools are not at the place and time where they're going to be ready for this. And that's okay. If you can look and you can start to find schools where they're doing STEM related things and they've got an integrated mindset where they're like, Hey, look, how do we, you know, do, you know, uh, some of the more adventurous type things or whether it's the robotics or it's the um you know it's the 3d printing or the lasers or whatever that side of things might be if you can find the schools that are doing that or maybe the teachers that are doing some of that and offer great if you don't get reception that's okay what i would say is turn around and you know go back to the arrl and say hey who, where is a school within my geography that maybe I can reach out to and I can support in some way, right? Because we can give in different ways, right? Some of us have the ability to write checks. Some of us have the ability to give time. Some of us have the ability to, you know, give of ourselves. And some of us have the ability to give knowledge and mentoring, right? Like there's all different ways of being able to give. And it's a matter of finding the the outlet for whatever we're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a hold of, of Steve Goodgame, then you can be maybe connected with a school that is ready to receive it. Because again, if we invest in the schools that are there and they're ready to go with it, they just need to build that scaled capacity, then we can create in the other schools based off of the schools that are being successful. You, you, you might say like, oh, well, that school's already got something going on. Well, yeah, but that one school might have the ability to affect two or three or five others. You are totally right. It's it's oftentimes way harder to get a school that's not ready to to become ready because a lot of it has to be like a grassroots effort from the educators that are in the school. Outsiders, and this is no offense to schools, but they're kind of an insular learning body, at least schools being a school. And they're not necessarily like taking cold calls from people like, hey, I'm a ham guy. Let me do ham radio things. You don't know me. But if a teacher goes, hey, I want to do this ham thing, all of a sudden the doors open up a lot easier, I think. A absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. And again, when you have one school that will go back to, say, like, whether it's the principal or the or the teacher or the curriculum right. director or whomever that goes and meets with all of their other schools in their area and their geography and they and have they're that and they're the talking area. about what they're doing, which is a tantamount right. of like showing off. Right. Basically, it's like we got something you don't have. Da 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 da. They're not right. doing that, but you, you, it, that's how it comes across. They're like, wait, we want that. We yeah. want that amazing STEM education thing that you're doing. Why can't right. we have what you have? Well, it, it's also about fitting fitting the students that you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. We all have students. Every single school has students that are that are inclined in this particular way. They're there. And they it's don't have an outlet in a lot of cases. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 
And so if you can find a way to be able to provide an outlet, other schools are looking and they're listening for that. Because, you know, in my group of students, I have students everywhere from, you know, the students that are extremely gifted to extremely struggling, everywhere in between, all walks of life, every level of learning strategy or, or skill set, like all of it, all the way across the board. And they're all able to thrive because they're able to find something that they are passionate about inside right. of this. Right. And so this is something that is replicable at other schools that the other schools just don't know about it. And they have to be ready to hear it from somebody else that is like them. So when yeah. a principal says it to another principal or a physics teacher says it to another physics teacher, or if a curriculum director says it to another curriculum director, they're more apt to hear it than a, a random outsider coming in saying, Hey, yeah. there's this really cool thing. Yeah. Which, Maybe it works, right? Maybe it does. The other part to, to play in all of that is if you've got a passion for doing this for schools, reach out to the scouts, right? Reach out to the, the local troops and offer it, at, offer your services as a radio merit badge counselor. Yeah, right? we need more because, of that too. Because that will be an into the schools as well at, in some way, shape or form. Because those kids are going back. They're doing that and they're right. going into those schools and they're doing things. But then also if you can, Go to the local library, put a flyer up. Hey, we're offering through our club a class on how to do this. You're going to find that kids in the schools, their parents are paying attention to that. And they're like, hmm, there's this really cool thing happening through the library. It's called Radio. I didn't really think about that. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will get them. If, they will, if you build it, they will come. That's one of my wife's favorite quotes. <laughs> no question. Mitchell Pilot with another super chat, nine ninety nine. Thank you so much, Mitchell Pilot. I, I, we really do appreciate it. So let let's get to the end here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it, well, this will be the last one uh, for Drew. Has he heard of any former student stories or success stories based on this program? You haven't been doing it that long, so maybe not yet. But you know, so I, I, I I see that in your future. <laughs> So we had, uh, we've got two of our, our alumni that uh -huh. have come back. And so there we've got two alumni that are in different engineering programs. One's a comp sci major. No, I'm sorry, not comp sci. He's computer engineering. Okay. And then we, and then we have another one that's aerospace engineering and they both just came back. They're both at Penn state and they both just came back and they did a presentation for our students about their experiences so far in engineering programs in college and what they, you know, wish they had done in high school and what they, you know, are doing now and the fun things that they're able to experience and, and basically what our group helped them with along the way. Um, and so, you know, ag again, for the kids, yes, they, they can see themselves now, right? Like that's, the, that's, that's so important for kids. They yeah. have to be able to see themselves. Like right? there's a reason why most kids do the things that their families have done, right? Like it, it, when you look at it statistically, there's a reason why like 60 to 70% of kids do the things that their parents did or a connected thing to the yeah. thing that their parents did. And it's because we emulate the things that we see. And right. so now bringing the alumni back in, they can say, well, Hey, I sat in those seats you know, a few years ago, I was doing these things a few years ago. And now here I am doing these other things. You can become, you can go into aerospace engineering too. You can go into computer science or computer engineering too. You could do these things too. Yeah. You're just programming in our, in C++ in Arduino right now, but yeah, you can do all of this other stuff too, you know, as you grow with your skills. So yes, yes. And yes. I love it. I love it. Uh, last thing I can hopefully answer david asks josh how do you find drew this is amazing well very easily he's on qrz literally his call signs ac3ds and i uh, i have it here on the zoom main page so uh pull him up on qrz and you can email him based off of how he has uh selected communications on qrz you can reach out directly if uh if that is something you're interested in drew this has been a fantastic discussion i i again you're your energy about this, but also the way you approach education, I think not, I think is unique. I'm going to say unique, but you're, of course, not alone in this. But it's only through more people looking at education like you do, I think, that is truly going to make really 
well-rounded, educated kids, because you're really empowering them to drive their education and to own it instead of it being forced upon them. Like so many kids feel sometimes this can be that they're, they're now like, wait, school doesn't have to suck. I can learn something that is actually really interesting. And in high school, that's such a dichotomy that you have to walk behind. So I, I just, my hat's off to you. This has just been so much fun talking with you. I knew this was going to be great. I, I saw you on mics. I was like, I'm getting through. I'm getting, he's, he, the energy is, is unmistakable. I know this is going to be fantastic. And yeah, this is probably one of my longer live streams that I've done with with a guest so you're you're just a fantastic guest so thank you for being on the show thank you josh appreciate it yeah yeah so hang tight drew i'm gonna wrap up the show because we're already way too long i gotta thank okay. the patrons hang tight uh, i don't know if you got time oh, yeah, uh, i know time. okay so have you ever thought you're already you know about discord right yeah my kid yeah my, my kid my my students blowing have been blowing it up Okay, wow. so I got a, I've got a Ham Radio Crash Course Discord, and we're going to do an after chat. It's like a live stream after the live stream where there there might be people that want to ask you questions. So I don't know if you've you've joined sure. the Discord, but yep. uh, if you want to take, go ahead and uh, pull up the pull up the 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 video, and then join the Discord and go to hashtag dash live stream. But stay on the Zoom, and I'll walk you through it after okay. the uh, the stream. So I'll wrap things up. But again, thank you a thousand times, and we're going to have to have you back to get a little uh, update on how things are going. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I man, that how fun was that, guys? Oh, see my radio. See, this is supposed to be where's my radio? Where is it? Come back. 7610. Doot, doot, doot. There it is. Haha. <laughs> guys, this is a fantastic talk. I had so much fun. This is like uh this is what it it and, and here's the thing. Here's the thing. It it's not kids. It's not uh, this is kids in this case. This is like how you make a high school program thrive. You can do this with a club. You can do this with your, your friends. You can do this with so many other things. And, and it will teach people and educate them about amateur radio. And that's we just need more of that. Let, let, let loose the reins of trying to drive the horse down the road and say, this is what we could do. Do you want to do this? Let's, let's join you know, into this together. But anyway, thanks, everybody, for watching. Got to say a big thank you to the patrons. Next weekend, boy, howdy. The month has already caught up with me really, really hard. Uh, we're going to have a patron picks episode, which is the Patreon supporters get to vote for the video. So next Saturday is a patron picks episode. They're voting right now, and they still have time to vote. So if you'd like to join me on Patreon and help support what we do here on the Hammer Radio Crash Course, just go ahead and take the link in the description, and you can join the producer's level, which lets you vote. And the vote is what tells me what you want to talk about. Let, much like the kids! Give everybody the options and let them vote, right? That's what we're doing, except it's on Patreon, so it helps support my channel. So I, I do appreciate that, and I do appreciate you taking the time to watch the show and hang out. So uh, lots of chat, man. Our chat was exploding through this whole thing with really good questions. We didn't get to answer all of your questions. We're going to wrap things up here, and and Drew's maybe going to join us. I'm not going to I'm not going to speak for him if he doesn't have the time, but uh, he's going to try and hop on. So if you have questions from an educator standpoint, or you want to know how to do something like this on your own or at your home area, go ahead and join us. The link is in the description on Discord, and go to hashtag dash live stream, and then under that there's a voice chat hashtag dash dash live stream after chat, and that's the voice chat where you have to select a mic and a speaker so you can actually talk to us because let me just go ahead and throw this out there. Ham radio questions are seldom easy and questions like these are ones where we're going to have to ask you something a little bit about what you're trying to do so that we can answer your question appropriately. So we take the time. I take the time every week to hopefully sit down and answer your questions and do what we can to help you out in your journey in amateur radio. So I hope you avail yourself of that. So yeah, very good. Anything else I need to mention? Reminder, camp out. Would love it if you come out to the camp out. I'll bring out a bunch of radio gear. The link is in the description. It is in Silverwood, outside of Hesperia, California, which is not a place that a lot of people necessarily go, but I promise it's not hard to get to. And thank you, all the patrons. So, uh, yeah, take the links in the description to find out more of what we're all about. Anyway, I am Josh, KI6NAZ. I've had a wonderful time in this live stream. I hope you did too. And if you did, give me a thumbs up. And if you're new here and you'd like to see more of what I'm doing, click subscribe and I'll talk to you later. 73.
Enjoy those memes. The ham radio memes drive the whole channel.